glad you're with us today. Uh, I'd like to begin by praying for us because of our topic today, and then we'll dive in. So would you would you join me? God, we're so thankful for who you are and in this series. Um, I know that just over and over again, I've either seen things about you in a new way or learned more about who you are and how I ought to live because of that or how I should relate with others. And so I pray today, just do the same thing. Help us to see you lift our eyes um, off of ourselves and this world around us and the distractions of life so that we could continue to worship you and be drawn in um, to your presence and that our lives would be transformed. Thank you for your goodness in doing that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're wrapping up a series we've been in for a number of weeks, uh, I think 13 or 14, uh, and we're looking at the, the nature and character of God himself. And so we've been looking at different attributes of God, things that are true about him and how they interact. Um, and, and as we've said over and over again, you can't really do that adequately, and we're not saying we are, but we just want to learn more about who God is. And the goal all along has been, as I just prayed a minute ago, that we just be drawn in closer in our walk with him, that our lives would just continue to be not only saturated, with the things of God, but God himself, so that we can live for him in this crazy uh, world and culture we find ourselves in. Today, as we sum it up, I was kind of reflecting, I probably should have done this one first, but we saved the best for last. We're going to talk about how God is triune today, the three in one. This is a, a the, even the word Trinity, I like the word triune better, and that'll become clear as we get into it. But this idea of Trinity, of this, whatever the threeness of God is, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it, it's, it's not, the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it's one of those things that's kind of always in the background. It's not really an attribute of God, but it's just more of a way the Bible talks about God and reveals him to us. Uh, there's not one passage that lays out, you know, therefore thou shalt believe in the Trinity, and here's how to understand it. Uh, but it's just assumed all over the Bible. Like I said already, never in the foreground, always in the background. And one writer said this, the doctrine of the Trinity is the most important Christian doctrine that most people never think about. It's absolutely essential to our faith, and yet for many Christians, it just seems like a very confusing math problem. Even if we can figure out what Trinity means, it doesn't feel like it has much bearing on our lives or much relevant or relevance excuse me, to us. And you may have thought that with yourself, like, why do I have to, if the words are not in the Bible, why is it such a big deal to people? Why is it in all these creeds and confessions that the church has kind of held to for a long time? So we're going to try to look into that a little bit today. And there's no way to do this justice in 30 minutes or whatever, whatever time we take. But I want to do it by looking at a few things. The first one is, what is it? What is this idea? What does it mean when we say God is triune? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about where is it in the Bible? Is it really in there? Is it or is something we kind of came up with? And where does the Bible talk about it? And then why does it matter? Like, what's the big deal? And then we'll finish by how can we respond to it. So let's start with what is it? The New City Catechism uh, says this in question three, how many persons are there in God? And here's their answer. There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And so there's actually seven statements you could kind of throw out for, to kind of lay out the logic of the doctrine of the Trinity. So God is one. There's only one God. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is also God. And then some add the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. The point is they're different. But there's only one God but three persons. How in the world can that be? But if you do get those seven statements, you captured the basic doctrine of the Trinity. It's what somebody means when they say, one God, three persons. So it's crucial for Christianity. It's concerned with who God is, what he's like, how he works, and how he's to be approached. And even tied up in this, the question of the deity of Christ, like that Jesus is God, it's historically been a point of great tension. And it's very much wrapped up in our understanding of the Trinity. Also, um, this was one of the one of the first to be worked out by the early church, and the reason they did it, and we'll see some of this later too, but is they, they had all these different teachings coming in, like, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. That's not the way the Bible talks about Jesus, but you're saying this about him. And that the Holy Spirit is described a certain way in Scripture, but you're talking about him differently. So we've got to figure this out. Well, what does the Bible really say? So that's kind of how it came, and it's, and it's also been like a a bulwark or, or, or a fortress to help Christianity protect against these false 
doctrines and heresies that were creeping up. Christians are monotheists, right? That means one God. We don't believe in many gods or a pantheon of gods, but one God. But God, this same God, expresses himself and exists as three persons. So this word persons is a key word that the church has kind of wrestled with over the centuries. So is this a contradiction? One God, three persons. And I'm going to argue, no, it's not. It's more of a mystery. Now, in Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul talks about this mystery, and and what he's talking about is that the Gentiles are now included. He's speaking to this new church and says, this should blow your mind. This is this secret that has long been hid from us until Jesus comes. And well, the Jews were supposed to be a light to the nations as well, but it was very uh, focused on God's people. But Paul says that the mystery has now been revealed. The, Jew, the Gentiles are included. So now the church is made up of people from all kinds of backgrounds, not just Jewish background people, but people from anywhere, everywhere. So now we know the mystery is out. It's like this secret, this thing we didn't know back then. That's how the Bible kind of uses the concept of mystery. So God is a mystery in that who he is and what he's like are, are secrets or mysterious meaning there are things we could have never worked out by ourselves, but God has chosen to reveal those things to us. So as as we see God as as disclosed in the scriptures, he explains himself uh, through the writers and prophets and everybody, what what he's like. This is where the mystery is shown. It's not like something we just go, I don't get that. I don't need to think about that. He, He wants us to see this. So it's not some piece of inexplicable nonsense. I love this. this. This British writer said this. It's not some piece of inexplicable nonsense like a square circle or an interesting theologian. I thought that was hilarious. You know, like those don't exist. The early church wrestled with this language and they, they, they use the word person to speak to the personality of the three members of the Trinity and also their relationship with each other, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But they're one essence but there are distinctions. One isn't the other. They're equal in rank, equal in power, equal in glory, equal in majesty. One writer, Norman Geisler, um, he was really sharp on this and a bunch of other things too. Um, he explained it like this. Essence is what you are. Person is who you are. So God is one what, but three who's. So this formulation of Trinity comes from the word Latin, Trinitas, meaning threeness. So it's it, they set out to kind of safeguard this and make sure we pay attention to this, not explain it. It's beyond us. But it confronts us, I think, this is what J.I. Packer said, with the most human, excuse me, difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. It's not easy, but it is true. You might be saying, okay, what in the world? This, this three persons one God. Let's get to where is it in the Bible? Because we can, you know, talk philosophically or whatever, or, you know, even the- theologize about it all day. But what does scripture say? Why do, where do we get this one God idea from? And you probably know a lot of this already, but it's important to walk through it. We're going to spend the bulk of our time reading some of these scriptures. So let's talk first about the one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the great Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eruhenu Adonai Echad. This is the proclamation of the Jewish people every day for generations. From Deuteronomy 6, 4, there's only one God. The Old Testament, this is all over the place. I'll just read you one of the references. We've got a bunch more in the handouts. We're going to look them up. Isaiah 45 Verse 21, declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Again, there are tons of references we we listed for you. But it says it over and over. Israel was, the Jewish people were clear that he was, there is one God. This was set over and against the polytheism of their day. The gods that were all over of all the other nations. Uh, and even in the nation, they had different gods for different things. It's not just in the Old Testament, though. Listen to Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, and 5. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. 
although there may be so-called gods in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many gods, it says in parentheses, and many lords. So he's saying there's only one God. Idols are fake. They represent something that is not actual or, or not the, the one true God. So this one God concept is all over the place in Scripture. But let's look at the Father as God, the Son as God, and the Spirit. Start with the Father. Just going to read some verses. Romans 15, 6, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So this Father is God. One more, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed, the same, almost the same phrase. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the Bible portrays uh, even the language with Israel and ma God making this covenant with Israel uh, like a like a, a father to them and, and just saying that I'm going to I'm going to treat you as my sons and daughters. It, the language is again throughout the Old Testament as well. We'll put more references in if you want to look those up. But what about the son? What about Jesus? Colossians 1.16, for in him, excuse me, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things are held together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything in him or he might be preeminent in everything. And then down in verse 19 of Colossians 1, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Romans 9, 5, to them belong the patriarchs, talking about the Israelites, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, the Messiah, this is Jesus. Listen to this next phrase, who is God over all. He's just directly called God. Titus 2, 13, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is clearly called God. We'll come back to, to the deity of Jesus in a minute as we uh, look into a few more verses. But he's called God all over the place. Jesus himself walked around and as he did things and, and they said, you know, who has the power to, the authority to forgive sins? And he said, I do doing things that only God would do, claiming to uh, be God himself. He would say things like, before Abraham was, I am. Like before Abraham even existed, he, and then he uses this name, I am, that God gave Moses. Uh, the I am statements in John, they're fascinating. He just does it over and over and over again. Next, the Holy Spirit is God. The Bible says that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. Acts 5, 3, and 4, we'll just read one here. This is when Ananias and Sapphira had sold some property and brought it and gave it to the apostles to help with the work of the ministry. Um, but they lied about the, how much it was. They said, we're giving you all of it, but they withheld some. They didn't have to give it all, but they just lied. It was a problem. They didn't have to give anything, actually. But they chose to give and wanted it to look like they gave up everything. But Peter confronts them. In Acts 5, 3, it says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Like, you could have given whatever you wanted. You didn't have, it's your property. It's awesome you want to share, but don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Then it says, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So he's saying you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. Same thing. The Holy Spirit is God. Uh, you can see Psalm 95, 3, 8, and 9, and how it's explained in Hebrews 3, 7. Uh, the Spirit is God. And we'll see in the next passages here. I wanted to show you the one God. God is, uh, excuse me, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. But let's look at the triune God for a minute. There are passages where all three are referred to. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is kind of the conclusion with this greeting, this blessing. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You see the Trinity all together there, the three persons. You see this in the baptism of Jesus. The Father speaking from heaven, as in Mark 1, 10 and 11, it's recorded in uh, other gospel too. Father speaking from heaven, 
the spirit descending in the form of a dove as Jesus comes up out of the water. And he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit is present, showing uh, this um, blessing on that as well. So we see that all three members of the triune God in these passages together. We see it a lot in Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's in John shortly before he's killed. And he's praying to God and just asking God to uh, look after his people and, and for all kinds of things. Just let me just read a few verses. If you want to pause and open a Bible to John 17, we'll, we'll start at the beginning and just kind of skip down through um, some, some verses in there. John 17, 1. Listen to this. This is the beginning of the prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus is saying a lot here. But how did Jesus, how did the incarnation happen? Well, the, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary in this miraculous thing, and Jesus was born on this earth. The Son of God left the throne and came to earth as a human. So the Spirit was involved. God sent him, we see in here. And he says, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Jesus has always been. This is incredible. A little bit later down in verse 20 of John 17. He says, I don't ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their words. He's talking about his disciples and the people that would become Christians later. All of his followers would share the gospel and there'd be more people come in. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Then a little bit later, verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me, these new believers, may be with me where I am to see the glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. We'll come back to this love in, in a little bit. But you see what's going on. Jesus is, is calling out to the Father. He says, remember, you sent me, don't remember, but do the same you know, things as you send me. I want to send them and that glory that I had before. And I want, I want them to be with us. This is the goal of, of this Trinity has had a purpose all along, and this purpose has, has been to accomplish something incredible for, for a, an incredible purpose to show their level. We'll come back to it. Think about John 1, 1 through 3. He was, oh, in the beginning was the Word, this Word that God spoke into existence a world, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This affirms, it's talking about Jesus here in the beginning of John, the Word. This affirms that he is God, and at the same time he was with God, showing that he's a distinct person from God the Father. So this is, this is all over the place, again, in the Old and New Testament. The, the, these are attributed, um, the Messiah even would be called God in John, or excuse me, Psalm 110. Colossians 2.9 says of Jesus, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So how in the world, like who would have ever thought this up? If you're going to make up a religion or you're going to try to write the Bible just on your own, you would never come up with this concept. Think about this. These are Jewish people, especially in the New Testament. They're, they're, Jesus is on the scene and it's almost exclusively a Jewish audience at first. There's only one God. I mean, there's no debate. There's no doubt about it. They say the Shema every day. Um, they all memorize it from before they could even remember. They had it in their, you know, in their heads when they were little. But when they saw the greatness of Jesus they realize there are depths in God that we could have never imagined. I mean, it, when, when the disciples first saw Jesus in Matthew 28, we'll read the passage in a minute, they worshiped, some doubted, but they worshiped. Jesus, as people, as he, as he went on earth, and people say, are you claiming to be God? And he, yep, he wouldn't deny it. He'd say, yeah, you know, that's exactly what's, what's going on here. Before Abraham was, I am. And people would, would start to worship him, and he'd let them. He didn't stop them, because he's God. 
But think about Revelation 22. This is John is receiving all this revelation, and he's on the island of Patmos, exiled. And he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. So this is after all Revelation, the, the last chapter. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. How dare you worship me? I'm just an angel. But Jesus said, yeah, go for it. <laughs> the Old Testament, uh, Augustine said, it, it, it's like a furnished room dimly lit until you have the light of the New Testament shine in. So you, have, you read through and you, even in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the beginning was God. And then it says the Spirit was hovering. So the Spirit was there. Um, then in, in Genesis 1, it says, let us make man in our image. Like, let us make man in our image? What's going on there? Um, we were uh, at Hume Lake years ago, and my son was still in high school, and there, there was a guy that's a really good uh, speaker doing a, a kind of a, a lecture or talk or whatever on apologetics. Like, how do you how do you defend the faith? How do you, like, proclaim, like, what you believe and, and back it up with reality and scripture? And, you know, just to just be able to discuss with people that, that maybe don't like what you think. And so he put on, I think it was sunglasses. He said, well, I have these glasses on. I'm an atheist. And so, um, and everybody's like, okay. So he's like, he just says, I'm going to ask you some questions. You ask me questions. So he just gets into it. And one of the things he brought up, he's like, what's the deal with Christians? They made up the Trinity. There's nothing, that, that's not in the Bible. The word's not in there. And and so people are starting to say things. My son raises his hand. I'm like, oh, what's he going to say? You know, it was kind of exciting. And he says, well, Genesis um, says, let us make man in our own image. So there's something going on there. And it's so funny. He's like, you're a pastor's kid, aren't you? We just laughed, you know. Um, and later he said, okay, that he pointed out some different things that people said and good things and bad things. He said, oh, that was a good point. I was like, yeah, you know, um, full of pride, which is probably bad. But but we see this, there, like this dim hint of something going on here. It says the same thing again in 3.22 in Genesis um, 11, 7. Let us go down and, and check out the Babel thing. God is like speaking. It's not the royal we. I think it's a, it's a, it's a hint of the Trinity. Isaiah 6, 8. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord. Remember this vision of the temple and the throne and the, you know, just the rumbling and all that. And he falls down and says, I'm a dead man. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Then it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God is speaking this way. The answer really is when Jesus comes on the scene, it causes people to worship because they go, you know what? We, we understand more about God. There's something more going on here. This only, the only way to explain this complete shift of worldview for those early Jews that became believers is the resurrection. They said that is not just a person. That's not just a human that we've been spending all this time with. So the Bible has Trinity all over. It doesn't say the word, but this triunity of God is just on clear display throughout Scripture. This is why the early church said we have to stand for this. When people are saying, no, Jesus was just a human, they said, no, that's not right. The Spirit is just an impersonal force. No, the Bible doesn't talk like that. So they, they, they fought for this and figured it out. Well, why does it matter? I want to spend just a couple minutes on this and then we'll apply it. Why does it matter? Does it, is it really that big of a deal? I think from reading some of these verses about who Jesus is, you can already sense why. But sometimes people just get confused. Well, right, okay, I get the, the three and one or the one and three, but does this really make a difference? Um, but here's three reasons I think it should. First is unity and diversity. The Trinity helps us understand how there can be such a thing as unity and diversity. Uh, this is a pressing question even in our world today, right? Some folks focus exclusively on diversity, that people are so different, they don't see any common ground. Others want to press for like uniformity in thought or government or expression. The Trinity shows you can have a profound, real, organic unity in diversity since the Father, Son, and the Spirit are working in complete union in our salvation. The Father appoints, the Son accomplished, the Spirit applies. So when we encounter God as fully the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, um, and their work isn't interchangeable or redundant, this can help us in that. Better yet, though, not just unity and diversity, but eternal love. And this, if you let it, will blow your mind, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. When you have a triune God, Love was already there. It's existed from all time. So if you have a God who isn't three persons, he has to create a being to love. 
to, as an expression of that love. But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in eternity have always had this relationship of love. Again, this will blow your mind, but they've, there's always existed this love. Love isn't a created thing. God didn't have to go outside of himself to love. Love is eternal. When you have a triune God, you have an always loving God. God is love because God is triune. And love is actually what brings about this whole plan of redemption and restoration, making possible a relationship with God. This is incredible when you really think about it. God didn't create humanity because I don't have anybody to love. There was already love within the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He just wanted more people to experience and know that love more. He, that's why he created humanity and this whole the, the whole plan of redemption came about. So this unity and diversity, eternal love, and then you get God as he is. And I mean, it, you get the real God. Um, the doctrine of the Trinity is important for the Christian because there's nothing more important in all the world than knowing God. That's the point of it all. That God's This trying God is what sets Christianity apart. So we get the actual God. It can help us not fall for like counterfeit religions and, and false gods. Islam says it this way. The Quran says this, Say not, Trinity, desist. It will be better for you, for God is one. Glory be to him. Far exalted is he above having a son. Then it says, Say, he is Allah, or he Allah is one. Allah is he on whom all depend. He begets not, nor is begotten, and none is like him. So uh, the Quran says, He is in no sense a father or a son. So Allah, or Allah, is utterly different than a God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Very distinct from the God of Christianity. Just Wednesday, yesterday, um, some two young teenage-looking girls come to the door, knock on the door, and they're dressed really nicely. And, and they said, we'd like to give you a pamphlet to invite you to uh, as Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. And I take a little pamphlet. and um, Listen to the way they describe who Jesus is. And I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but just listen to some of the differences in the way the Trinitarian God or the Trian God of the Bible is. Scriptural evidence indicates that the name Michael applied to God's son before he left heaven to become Jesus. So they say the archangel Michael is the same person as Jesus. And also after his return. So Jesus went back and now he's the archangel Michael again. In his pre-human existence, Jesus was called the Word. He also had a personal name, Michael. By retaining the name Jesus after his resurrection, the Word shows that he is identical with the Son of God on earth. His resuming his heavenly name, Michael, and his title, the Word of God, ties him with his pre-human existence. The very name Michael, asking as it does, who is like God, points to the fact that Jehovah God is without like, equal, and that Michael, his archangel, is a great champion, or his great champion, or a vindicator. So you see, that's a very different description of who Jesus was before. He was an angel to them before. Um, to take uh, Mormons, they, they don't like that name anymore, Latter-day Saints or whatever. Um, it's a, these two Jehovah's Witness Mormons are newer religions. They've just been around for a hundred you know, and few years, unlike Islam, which is much older. But this is from their webpage. Like many Christians, we believe in God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. However, we don't believe in the traditional concept of the Trinity. We believe the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are three separate beings or one in purpose. So they say their unity is in what they do or like accomplish, but they're separate, three separate beings. And listen to, this is from a BYU devotional I can give you the, it's called Our Relationship with the Lord. Um, it follows that the devil would rather spread false doctrine about God and the Godhead and induce false feelings with reference to any one of them that, than almost any other thing he could do. So it's like the devil's main thing, they say. Um, I lost my place. Oh, sorry. The creeds of Christendom illustrate perfectly what Lucifer wants so-called Christian people to believe about deity in order to be damned. Whoa. Truly the most grievous and evil heresy ever imposed on an erring and wayward Christianity is their creedal concept about God and the Godhead. So that means that the creeds that, like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed that we would adhere to, that the Christian church throughout the ages has since they were um, created, the first one by the Apostles. Here's one more. We have imagined and supposed this is from Joseph Smith himself, that God was God from all eternity. So he says, this is what we've kind of been taught or thought. I will refute that idea. Take away the veil so that you may see. 
I'm going to show you what's true. These are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another. So far, you're like, okay, listen to this. And that he was once a man like us, that the God, or excuse me, God, the father of us all dwelt on earth, the same as Jesus. So this is a very distinct description of God, that God was just a human, just like us at one point. So we see that as a church, even now today, has to defend against these strange ideas that are trying to be brought forward in our world and culture, that we get the true God in the Trinity. So if God exists as one God in three persons, if the one divine essence is Father, Son, and Spirit, if we're baptized into his name, then no Christian should want to be ignorant of these realities. In the end, the triune God matters because God matters. All right, so how can, how can we respond to this? Like, what do, you, what do we do? And I want, to, I want to go to one of my favorite places where the Trinity is on display in the New Testament. So if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew 28. I just want to draw some application out of here for us. Matthew 28, 16, as we read this, it'll probably sound pretty familiar. But this is what we sometimes call the Great Commission. Verse 16 of Matthew 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, as we already talked about. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm always, or with you always, to the end of the age. So some worshiped, as we said before, some doubted. Jesus starts by saying, all authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth. This has been given to him by God the Father. And he's been put on the earth through the Spirit. Think about Jesus' mission on earth. He came so that God could be known and now he turns to us and he gives us some kind of, because I've come in all this authority and come to do this, to basically offer the plan of redemption, what does he tell us to do? Straightforward. He says, go and make disciples. And you're like, how does that have to do with the Trinity? Think about all that God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, this is, this is culminating in this, this offering of Jesus. He's going to return and bring in the new heavens and the new earth. Go and make disciples. You are a missionary. If you live around here, you're a missionary to California. And we need this more than ever in post-Christian USA. Uh, there are probably more nuns in our state than, than most others, or maybe all of them. I've looked at the stats lately. A nun is someone who says, I have no religious affiliation when they're asked in a survey. I don't believe in anything, any God or anything like that. I'm, I'm non-religious. So this is what we do in response to all that God has done throughout all the ages to build up to the time when Jesus would come to offer salvation. It begins with salvation. How do you go and make disciples? Making a disciple, it's introducing people to Christ. Um, this is what we do. This is, this is how we respond to the fact that God has been working all this plan uh, through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We obey Jesus' commands. He says, go and make disciples. So this is introducing people to Jesus. They have to know him first and become a disciple to so like give their life over to him. Um, we were down a couple months back, I think it was back in February, I got to go down with Elijah to check out a mission training school uh, in Tijuana, and it's called Radius, and I remember them saying, I've heard this from other people too, but don't go try to be a missionary, come to our school for missions training, to go to some far off country if you're not ready to be a missionary where you live. So for us, if this, is, this amazing God really loves the world and did all this so that we could come to know him, let's go tell people about it, go and make disciples. Um, it was pretty cool. Uh, Fourth of July, Elijah sent me a note. He says, "Hey, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a booth at the parade, like just to share the gospel with people." Said, That's a great idea. And so he sent me a picture of the banner. I don't know if you're around; you probably saw it. But he, he said, "I'm just gonna go sit there and see if anyone wants to talk to me." Um, and, and a few friends joined him a little bit later after he'd been going for a little bit. But what an incredible thing! Just say, I'm gonna go tell people about Jesus. I have to. So go and make disciples. And then it says, baptizing them into the name. So this is where it is awesome. It, 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 in your translation, it might say baptizing them in the name, but this word is into. 
What does it mean to be baptized into the name? The name is the nature in the being. Names for us just sort of like a title, or not even a title, it's just something we made up our parents gave us. But the name here, God says, I'm going to put my name at the temple. Moses says, I want your name to go with us. God even often has people change their name. Like, you were Abram, I'm going to call you Abraham. You were Saul, you are now Paul. Because it's this new thing going on. It's it's being baptized into something that is greater and this new it's the church i mean it's this body of christ everywhere so we're baptizing somebody into it they're they're like changing allegiance in that this is massive this is just referring to when someone becomes a christian they get baptized that's just what you do but they're baptizing into the name of the triune god because he says in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit this is amazing into the name singular of the three plural it doesn't say into the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it says into the name. This means you're being baptized into all that God's kingdom is about. Three persons, one name. Three persons, one nature. This is a crazy statement. And Jesus is saying, this is what we're all about, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. This is what we came to accomplish. So go make disciples. Baptize them into the name. Like bring them into the kingdom of God. Third thing, and there's only one more after this, teach them how to live for Jesus. This is what he says, um, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teach them all that we've been about. This is what discipleship is really made up of. It's not teaching them lessons, although it can be that. It's not going through a book with somebody, although that can be a part of discipleship. But it's showing someone how to live out the Bible, how to observe, it says, how how to follow Jesus. And I think so often we forget this is our calling in life. You're not a a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or a mom or a grandpa or a golfer or someone that likes to fish. You are a disciple maker who happens to do those other things. You're a disciple maker that happens to sell real estate. But your main goal, your main task is to make disciples, teach them how to live. The last thing is remember he's with you. Jesus says, uh, the old translation I, I memorized, and lo, I am with you. But here, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Meaning, I'm going to come back. That's the end of the age, when I return to judge the quick and the dead. But how is Jesus with them? Shortly after this, he ascends to be with the Father, where he is interceding for us, where he is reigning and ruling over the universe, and, and you know, back with the Father in the Spirit, the triune God back to where he was before he came to earth. And this is where we see in John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, he'd been the first one, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus, the first helper, was about to be murdered, buried, raised to life on the third day. But now he says, I'm going to send the Spirit. On Pentecost, the Spirit came. And from that day forward, everybody that's ever become a Christian, according to Ephesians 1.13, is given the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. The Spirit is in us to make us holy, to bear fruit in our lives. He's the guarantee of our inheritance, to be with God in the new heavens and the new earth, and to be with us even now. And so it may seem like, what are you doing with Matthew 28, talking about the Trinity? This is where Jesus, it's on full display. He says, go do this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. One way to react to this incredible, beautiful truth is to do just that. Go make disciples. Go find people that don't yet know Jesus and introduce them to him. And then show them how to live for him. And trust the Spirit to do that good work in you. He, it even says the Spirit will give us words in that moment. When you're witnessing, you're like, I don't even know what to say right now. So don't worry about it. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Just just start talking. Think about what you're going to say. Be articulate. Do research, all that. But God will take care of it. Just speak. So my encouragement to us is let's do just that this week. I want to pray for us one more time before we wrap it up. Join me if you would. God, it's such deep waters to think about how in the world all this fits together. But we know the Bible clearly portrays that there's one God. That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. So I pray as we worship you that that would just enrich our hearts to know that you are much more complex and much deeper uh, than we can ever know. And God, as we as we live our lives, we respond in obedience out of great, uh, just out of uh, gratitude for what you've done for us. And we'll give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name, Amen.